to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh genesis chapter 2 verse number 24. welcome to our study of the home and especially today as we think about the wonderful subject of marriage. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. As always, we encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area where you'll find people who love the Lord and are indeed concerned about lost souls. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on the home or any of our lessons, please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a, a host, a wide variety of Bible study material that could aid you in your study of God's Word. And if you have a question, or maybe you'd like to study the Bible further, friend, we invite you to contact us with those questions or requests. You can email us or contact us through the information on our website or at the end of today's lesson. Today we think about the vitally important subject of marriage. Marriage is indeed the key to the home, to the family, to society, and to the nation being what God wants it to be. But what exactly is marriage? Many times we turn to definitions like Webster's to define what marriage is. For example, Webster states this about marriage. He says that marriage is the state of being united to a person of the opposite sex as husband or wife in a consensual and contractual relationship recognized by law or it is the state of being united to a person of the same sex in a relationship like that of a traditional marriage. Well, is Webster the authority when it comes to marriage? Is it the case that whatever the state recognizes, that must be a marriage, whether it's between a man or a woman, or whether it's between two men or two women? Sometimes we look to places like a legal dictionary to define what marriage is. For example, Black's Law Dictionary defines marriage this way. Marriage, as distinguished from the arrangement to marry and from the act of becoming married, is the civil status of one man and one woman united in law for life for the discharge to each other and the community of duties legally incumbent on those whose association is founded on the distinction of sex. Well, is marriage really just a contractual agreement based on civil law and for the purpose of human relations? You know, Tennessee even has its own definition of what marriage is. For example, they legally define it this way. Marriage is the legal union in matrimony of only one man and one woman shall be the only recognized marriage in this state. Any policy, law, or judicial interpretation that purports to define marriage as anything other than the historical institution and legal contract between one man and one woman is contrary to the public policy of marriage. Well, it's good that states have put into their laws stipulations that define marriage indeed as one man and one woman sharing rights and responsibilities together. But friend, our nation is headed down a path where such may not be the case very much longer. In 1996, in fact, the Defense of Marriage Act was put in place and it was an act of Congress and it said this, in determining the meaning of any act of Congress or of any ruling, regulation or interpretation of the various administrative bureaus and agencies of the United States, the word marriage means only 
a legal union between one man and one woman as husband and wife, and the word spouse refers to only a person of the opposite sex who is a husband and wife. Well, friend, as you can tell, things have changed a lot since 1996. We now have a host of states and our government and its president supporting marriage as not just a union between a man and a woman, between two men, between two women, homosexual marriage is on the rise. Is that really what God intended for marriage to be? Is that really what God wants it to be? Let's hear a Bible definition. You know, we show all these definitions given by men to show that society has for some time recognized marriage between one man and woman, but it's also changing. But here's the thing that doesn't change. What is the Bible definition of marriage? Notice quoted by Jesus in Matthew 19 verses 5 and 6 to apply to people in the New Testament age, those of us today, from Genesis 2.24 given as a law of creation. Here's what the scripture says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. How did God define marriage? Two people, man and woman, coming together, uniting themselves in the sight of God to serve as one family unit. And God says, what I've joined together, let not man separate. And so let's think about then from the scripture. What are some of the fundamentals we know about marriage? Well, we know first of all that marriage is instituted, given, authorized, and created by God. It was ordained by Him. It's His plan, His idea. He's the one who made marriage. And thus, as the home goes, so goes society and the church. What did God institute marriage for? Well, God created for Adam a woman named Eve. In Genesis 2.18, God saw that it was not good for man to be alone, companionship. And so He made him a helper to help him live life, to enjoy life, to help him get to heaven, a helper comparable to him. And thus God instituted marriage to help Adam and to help every man and woman in this life to face the challenges, to enjoy the, the blessings and the beauties of it, and to help one another through life as a companion or a helpmate. What else do we know about marriage? Not only is it instituted or given by God, marriage is a covenant. It's an agreement that two people enter into willingly and very seriously. Romans 7 verses 1 through 4 shows that the old law. It's really an illustration about the old covenant being done away with, the old law dying, and Christ and His new covenant coming forth, and we being married to that today. But He uses the illustration of marriage to show that it was to be until death do two people part. It, it's a contract. It's an agreement. When two people decide to marry, that's a very serious agreement. That's something binding upon them until death. The only other exception Jesus gave in Matthew 19, 9 was fornication and then and only then does the innocent party have the right to remarry. And so we think about marriage not only as ordained by God, but as a very serious contract or covenant that must not be, listen carefully, must not be entered into lightly. When we say that, we mean this. Just because two people, maybe at a young age or maybe at any age, have a fuzzy, warm feeling for one another, isn't a license to marry. There needs to be forethought. There needs to be planning. There needs to be a host of decisions talked about. And then two people, before they enter into marriage, need to realize we're going to make this work no matter what until death do us part. A third fundamental about marriage is this. Marriage is indeed the beginning of a new 
family, or home unit. And we say that for this purpose. When God said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, there's a very important principle taught there and it's this. Two people, when they marry, are now in their home governed by God's laws in their family unit and they're not governed by father and mother anymore. They leave father and mother and they start their own family unit. Here's where that's important. They make their own decisions based on the Bible. They're accountable now for their own actions. What father and mother do or don't do is not what governs their home. They need to be a new unit that looks to God that no longer looks back to father and mother where they once lived and where they were once of a part of a family unit. They now need to rely on each other put their trust in God together and strive to work together as a family to help and indeed help their children and themselves get to heaven. Well, what are some of the purposes of marriage? Why did God create the wonderful relationship of marriage? One of the first reasons we see in Scripture is to provide companionship. Do you remember Genesis 2 verse 18? God looked down on His creation, Adam, the first man, and God saw something. He had created all the animals and Adam had named them and all the birds and all the fish and Adam had given them names and, and still a companion was at, for Adam was not found. And so the Lord God saw this. God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. Why did God create Eve for Adam? Well, here's why. To provide companionship. Man, by his very nature, is not designed to be a loner. He's not designed to live somewhere in a monastery all his life by himself. That's not how God designed man. No. God created man with the unique need and ability to have companionship, to share his life, to enjoy the ups and to and the downs together and to, to depend and rely and to need one another in this life. One of man's basic needs is for that companionship. God said in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 12, two are better than one and a threefold cord cannot quickly be broken. There's strength, there's power, and there's encouragement in companionship these days. If that's the case, then friends listen carefully. If our marriages are going to be what God wants them to, we need to really be the companion that we ought to be. We need to share in our conversation, share in our joys and our hurts. We need to strive to be as close as we can be and have that companionship, the blessing that God gave us of another person to share that with. Another purpose for marriage found in the Bible is to propagate the human race. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God said to His creation, Be fruitful and multiply. Society today does not see marriage as an important part in accomplishing this. Now, I want you to think about this. If part of man's responsibility, and, and we understand that in a relationship where a husband or wife can't do that for medical reasons, maybe one of them can't have children, we're not saying that, that they're sinning against God, but... That is one of the purposes. God desires godly offspring. He wants us to bring children into the world and to raise them to know Him and His laws. And society today just doesn't see that as an important way to accomplish the purpose that God has for marriage. Now, I want you to think about this. If part of the purpose of marriage is to bring godly offspring into the world, can homosexuality accomplish that purpose? Can two men bring children into the world? Can two women bring children into the world? Well, of course not. That's biologically impossible. For it to take place, somewhere there has to be a man and a woman to bring children into the world. If part of the purpose of marriage is to propagate the human race, homosexuality cannot meet that purpose that God set forth for man and woman and thus we must realize it's contrary to the will of Almighty God. Let's then think about another purpose for marriage. God also set marriage in place 
to prevent sexual immorality. There's no doubt that each person is created with a sexual desire. That desire is given by God and good if used within the proper scope and area. Well, where is that proper area? It's reserved only for marriage. Hebrews 13, 4 says this, Marriage is honorable. The bed, speaking there of relations between a man and a woman, the bed undefiled, pure, holy, and right is the relationship, sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. But whoremongers and adulterers, God says, I will judge. You see, my friend, marriage should prevent sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 2 through 5, the Christians in Corinth wrote to Paul with some questions. And evidently, one of those questions had to deal with lust and desire and passion and how to control that. And Paul said, it's better to marry than to burn. Burn with what? Passion, lust, and desire. And thus, marriage is designed to prevent sexual immorality. I want you to listen real carefully to what we're going to say, and it's really important, especially to society today. So many people are taught that before marriage, sex, relations between a man and woman, all the things that go along with that, it's just testing the waters, that's okay, there's, there's not anything wrong with that, as long as you do it safely. It's not what God says. Planned Parenthood may provoke, promote safety. What does God say? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, God says this, Abstain from sexual immorality which wars against the soul. The only proper place for sexual relations is between a husband and a wife. Young people, listen carefully. Why is it the case that there are so many young mothers today, young women today with round bellies and no rings on their finger? Here's why. Because we think sexual immorality is okay today. We think it's okay if that's the case. Friend, that's not true. The only place God has authorized sexual relations between a man and a woman is inside the bounds of marriage. And, and in so keeping that, that keeps marriage special, it keeps it holy, and it keeps that relationship something given by God as a very important part of what God has set forth. And so, when we think about premarital relations, let's realize, while society may say that's okay, that's something that's sinful, that's something that's ungodly, and that's something that God Himself does indeed condemn. Let's think about another then vitally important purpose for marriage and it's this. God created man and woman. God created the home. God created marriage to help one another get to heaven. Now you think about this. In Matthew 19 verses 4 through 6 the Bible says what God has joined together let not man separate. I want you to think of marriage as a triangle. At the bottom corner, we've got man, and at the other side, we've got woman. And those two are joined together. But then, they're joined together by God. God is at the top of that triangle. He joins man to God, and man and woman to God, and then man to woman. Without God at the center, there can be no marriage that's going to bring honor to Him. And so marriage is to help one another get to heaven. Think about this. The closer we are to God, the closer we are to one another. If God's truly at the center of it, then the closer I am to God, naturally, the closer I am to my spouse, the closer I am to the one whom God has given me to help me get to heaven and to strive to be what God wants me to be in this life and to really please Him in everything that we say and do. In Psalm 34 and verse 3, a question is asked about marriage and God and, and how we can strive together to please Him. And, and the psalmist in essence says in Psalm 34 and verse 3, Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together. And so let's think for just a moment about our marriages. Are they really magnifying God as they ought to be? Are we doing what we should in the home? 
to give honor and glory to Him in everything that we say and do. I want to direct your attention for just a moment to the words of Paul as it relates to the family and the home in Ephesians chapter 5 and, and as Paul gives us some guidelines to follow for the home. Listen to Ephesians 5 beginning in verse number 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of wife, as the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What do we know about the husband-wife relationship? Husbands are to be the head of the home, meaning that they're to be the leaders. Are, are we out to make them a dictator? God never intended for the husband to be a, a dictator, giving out commands and bossing people around in that sense. That's not the idea. Are they the head of the home? Sure. Do they have authority given by God? Should that be respected? Absolutely. But the husband, as the head of the home, is the spiritual leader. He's the one who God placed at the top of that home. He's the one who carries the brunt of the load. And no doubt, he ought to strive to lead everybody spiritually in the right way. Well, what about wives? They're to submit to their own husbands. And the, the condition is, as to the Lord. Wives are not to lead the homes. That was never designed by God. There are homes where, sadly, the wife does have dominance, and that's not the way God said it. We're not saying that she's inferior, but rather there is a proper role and authority God set in order. Wives are to be submissive to their husbands as to the Lord. That phrase, as to the Lord, is a key to understanding that. For the Lord Himself expects each of us to be submissive, but how? The Lord doesn't force me. He doesn't make me. He doesn't do it in an ungodly or unkind way, no doubt. He does it. We submit to Him because we know He's looking out for everyone's best interest. He has our best interest at heart. And because we love Him, because He loves us, because I know He's leading us in the right direction, we indeed put Him first in the home and in the family. Now, notice a little further in Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning in verse number 25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her, that He might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the Word, that He might present her to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. What do we know about the husband and his relationship to the wife? He's to love her. How? As Christ loved the church. Well, how did Christ love the church? Acts 20, verse 27 and 28 tells us, Jesus loved the church so much, He purchased her with His own blood. He was willing to sacrifice, to give His life, to do everything possible to bring the church into existence. And friend, when we think about our own wives, husbands, ought to love their wives with that same sacrificial mindset. Are we putting them first? Are we really looking out for their interests? Are we making sure that, that physically, that emotionally, that financially, that in every way they're being provided for? That's part of the responsibility God gives to the husband. He wants his wife to be just as Christ wanted the church, to be pure and holy and spotless without blemish. He wants to put her up on a pedestal. That ought to be the mindset and the mentality that husbands have. Now, notice what Paul says a little further in Ephesians chapter 5. Beginning in verse number 28, the Bible says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves, him, loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. How am I to feel about the wife, my wife, just like I would my own body? Nobody's going to abuse, to ridicule, to look down. Nobody in their right mind is going to demean or do anything unkind to their own body. The greatest advice here goes all the way back to the golden rule. Matthew 7 verse 12, we ought to do unto others 
as we would have them do unto us. How do I want to be treated? How do I want to be related to? How do I want people to talk to me? How do I want to be loved? Those same ideas I have about how I want to be loved are the way I ought to love my wife, my children, and my family. We ought to be gracious and kind. We ought to give people the benefit of the doubt. We ought to strive to make people feel good, to build one another up. And no doubt, we ought to strive to help one another get to heaven. Friend, as we think about marriage, let's think about the spiritual relationship that each of us can have with God. God wants His children to be united with Him in a relationship in the church that is likened unto marriage where Christ is the head of the church, where God, is our, where God is our Father, and where as children we're submissive and obedient to Almighty God. We ask you today, have you submitted your life to the will of God? Have you really become a son or a daughter of God? If not, friend, why not enter into the greatest relationship you can ever imagine in becoming a child of God? You now will have the privilege to look up into heaven and say, Our Father who art in heaven. Matthew 6 verse 9. We have the benefit and the great blessing of having all our sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb. Acts 2 verse 38. And we have a new family, the church. Ephesians 2 verse 16. Where we encourage and we strive to help one another get to heaven every day. And so is marriage under attack, you bet it is. But can we do something to prevent that? Absolutely. Let's build our marriages on the foundation of God and His Word. Let's make sure that God is at the center and as the psalmist said, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. God desires godly offspring. He wants our marriages to be that which will help us really be the helpmate to get to heaven. But only we can do that. God's not going to force us. Let's determine today, each one of us, in our homes, in our families, and in our marriages, to put God first, to help every person in the family get to heaven, and to really be the light God wants us to be in a world of darkness. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee 37111.